Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll have one of our food segments funded by the North Dakota Humanities Council. But first, joining me is Susan Weefald, the author of Spectacular North Dakota Hikes, Bring the Dog. That's right. Susan, thanks so much for joining us Thank today. you. I'm happy to be here, John. As we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, I've lived in Bismarck since 1970, and I moved to Bismarck from Royal Oak, Michigan, where I grew up. But I was absolutely delighted to come to North Dakota because I was already a fan of the prairies and the wide open spaces. So when my husband said, will you marry me and move to North Dakota, it was a no-brainer. So I said, said, yes, yes. That was a package it deal. It was a package <laughs> deal. And so when I came, North Dakota has been so good to our family and to me. I had the opportunity to serve for 16 years as one of the state's public service commissioners. And I love that experience. It gave me a chance to learn a lot about North Dakota, visit a lot of people, interesting people all around the state, and to, of course, be very involved with the development of our energy industry here in the state of North Dakota. And I'm still very interested in energy issues. Mm. Well, but we're here today to talk about uh, the book. And uh, so so let's do that. Let's talk about the book and all the travels that you and, of course, your dog Sandy made. Uh, what made you decide you wanted to write this book? Well, serving on the Public Service Commission, I would have meetings all over the state. And I would need to go to this hearing or I'd need to go to this political function and I'd be driving most of the time by myself or, you know, uh, to these meetings or with my fellow commissioners. And I'd be passing places along the road that I think, oh my gosh, I wish I could stop and spend more time here. But nope, I've got to get back home and work on commission business or I've got family responsibilities. And so I was never able to do the hiking as many of the hikes in the state of North Dakota as I wanted to. Now, during that same time, I was taking vacations with my husband, Bob, and we would generally take a week or two in the summer and we'd go to another state and we would give ourselves a break and go visit that place or sometimes to a foreign country. Well, when we were there, Bob and I are both hikers. We've been hikers since we met 40 years ago. And so we would always pick a hiking trail to go on. Well, to pick a hiking trail, I didn't want to waste my time and go on the hikes that weren't very good. I would pick up a book about that state's hikes or that country's hikes, and I would pick one or two or three that I thought would be really interesting for us to visit. Those were great hikes. I started thinking as I read hiking books from all over the country, is there a hiking book like this about North Dakota? No, I couldn't find one on the shelves, and I looked and there wasn't one. So it was one of my goals, even when I was on the Public Service Commission, that when I retired, I started thinking about this book that I already knew kind of how I wanted to lay it out, et cetera. That when I finished, I would, at the commission, I would start and go hiking all around North Dakota and write a hiking book about our state. Because okay. we've got spectacular places. Places that are just as spectacular as anywhere in the country to go hiking here in our state. And when I say that, sometimes people are surprised. What? You found 50 spectacular hikes in North Dakota? Yes, I did, and I could have picked more, but I decided 50 was enough for one book. Well, now, what's been the reaction uh, to the book so far? People have been real enthusiastic about the hike, uh, the hikes that they have been able to take already. Uh, people have been happy to find a book that describes hikes that are from a half a mile long in our state to nine miles long. So, and also, I wrote this book not only for the person who is a hiker, or a walker, because there's really no difference. A walker is a person who's probably walking around Fargo here or in Bismarck on the tra trails, you know, the recreation trails in town, and they do that probably every day or several times a week. My goal is to get people to realize by re reading this book that there's very interesting places that they can go with their dog if they wish and go out and take a walk uh, anywhere in the state and discover some really spectacular new places. Hmm. And as I flip through here, uh, who did your illustrations and how did that come about? Well, my illustrations are done by Janet Flom, and she's from the Fargo-Moorhead area. And it was wonderful. The North Dakota Institute for Regional Studies, that's a part of North Dakota State University, they were willing to publish my book. And so they found this wonderful artist, Janet Flom, to do the illustrations. I always wanted my book to be illustrated uh, by someone because although photographs capture something, 
they don't capture not only the feeling of the place as well as an illustration. And I just always wanted to have my book have, because I also support the North Dakota arts a lot, I wanted to have it illustrated by a, uh, by a area artist. And so we were able to find a really good one. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I noticed in each chapter here, you have your notes yes. on, on, on the hike. But you also have Sandy's nose. Yes, I do. Dog. I do right. have my dog's, uh, uh, because my dog Sandy, he's a big dog, as you can see from the picture here. He's a golden doodle. He's uh, half uh, standard poodle and half golden retriever. When I got the dog, he was only supposed to be about 65 pounds because I had had German shepherds that were 100 pounds, and I decided I wanted a smaller dog. Uh, this dog just kept growing. I told my little granddaughter, Grace, who liked those dogs about Clifford the Big Red Dog, that Grandma had a dog like Clifford that just kept growing all the time. So, Standy is a special friend of mine, of course, and so Bob couldn't always go hiking with me because he was still serving as a district uh, court judge. And also, Bob wouldn't want to always go hiking with me, all right? Mm. And days came along, and it was a gorgeous day to go hiking, and sometimes friends were able to accompany me, me on my hikes. But my dog was always able to accompany me on my hikes. And he would stand there, you know, waiting for me to get going on an adventure. And so off we would go together to find these new places. And I always felt safe. I'd say with my cell phone in my pocket, and my dog by my side, I could go anywhere in North Dakota as a woman alone and hike and feel perfectly safe on the trails and just enjoy myself, not only just feeling safe, but just enjoy myself. So it was natural for me to record the dog's opinions of the trails and some of his thoughts, you know, of what we were seeing and what he was doing. So they're short and sweet, but yes, I do quote the dog. And um, I can tell you that there was some editing, of course, of the book, but there was very little editing of the dog sections. So I say that my editor thinks that I write like a dog very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you had the best perspective to write uh, from the dog's That's point of view. That's exactly well, right. With that said, uh, do you have maybe a, a, a short passage that you might share with us today? Sure, I do. Um, this is a section from the Valley View Trail. And at the start of each section, I, of, the, each, of each of the spectacular hikes, I write, what makes that trail spectacular? And this is from the Valley View Trail at Fort Ransom State Park. What makes this hike spectacular? The Cheyenne River Valley has a quiet beauty. The grasslands along the valley amid the tall burr oaks are described by locals as meadows rather than prairie. The rolling hills have gentle slopes. The hike features beautiful views of the Cheyenne River Valley. After a 0.75 mile hike down the grass and tree covered slope to the valley, you'll arrive at Sunny Farm. Here you can sit on the front steps of a log cabin built in 1875 and view other farm buildings added during the 75 years the Sunny family farmed here. And then for each section of the book, I also wrote, it's not really poetry, it's just a short thought about each section. Mm -hmm. And I wrote these because um, the book designer who worked with me said, we need something to complement the wonderful illustrations, Susan. So I wrote these one day when I was coming back on a car ride from Grand Forks to Bismarck, and I just heard a wonderful poet read her works. And so I thought, well, I would put something down in kind of free verse rather than in regular. And so, for example, for the Cheyenne River Valley, I wrote, I stop to examine a patch of native prairie and find an intricate tapestry of grasses and forbs. So mm -hmm. those were fun to write, and I hope that people enjoy those little bits of thought at the start of each chapter. I wrote the book so that people, not only hikers and walkers and dog lovers, would buy the book, but I wrote it for armchair travelers, people who just like in the month of January to sit still and read some read something on a cold January evening. And so this book allows people to travel all over the state, even if they're not hikers and walkers, who just want to learn more about the state and have the experience without leaving their armchair. Mm. Well, let's talk about some of the, the, the specific trails that, that hikers can go on. And, sure. And obviously in your, uh, I guess, you know, we've got it kind of through the book, but 
talk about some of the places and maybe some of the fa some of your favorites out there that, that you have. Well, I'll tell you, there's one that's far away, but I think it's well worth going to. It's at in the confluence of the Missouri and the Yellowstone rivers, and this is the Fairview Lift Bridge and the Cartwright Tunnel Trail. Well. If you have children in your family, this is the hike to take. Um, not only do you get to cross a bridge that's high above the Yellowstone River, only 17 miles of the Yellowstone River flow through North Dakota. Most people don't even think of the Yellowstone as being a North Dakota River, but it is. And we should, you know, take pride in that fact and get out to see it. It's a beautiful river. And right along this particular section of the river is where the cliffs are a wonderful yellow color. And in fact, the Yellowstone River was named the Yellowstone because of these cliffs. So many times when we go down to see the Great Falls of the Yellowstone and we saw, see all the beautiful colors in um, Yellowstone National Park, we think, well, that must be where this river got its name. No, it was from this area in North Dakota, which I thought was so interesting and which I mentioned in my book. But not only do you cross this high bridge, which used to be a, a railroad bridge, but which has now been converted to be a pedestrian bridge, then you go through a tunnel, and it is uh, a wonderful railroad tunnel that has since been abandoned. And so you walk in, and you can't see the other end from where you start, and it's very dark in there. One of the suggestions I make is that people be sure to bring a flashlight, because I found it was a little bit spooky inside this tunnel, and I didn't know what I would find inside this tunnel anyway. Um, but I uh, really enjoyed the experience. Bob went with me on this one. And then, uh, you know, you can stop and have a snack in the middle of the tunnel. I talked to one woman about this um, bridge, uh, about this tunnel, and she said it's the favorite place for her young son who turned seven. Uh, he said uh, she had taken him to the tunnel the year before for his birthday party. And he said, can we go back and take mm -hmm. that hike again? You know, so it's a great, great adventure for a family. And there's other, of course, interesting things in that area to see mm -hmm. as well. Closer to home, do you want one closer to home in the Red River Valley? Sure. A favorite? Sure. Okay, I would say another one closer to home would be, I love our prairie rivers of the Northeast. Those are really spectacular areas. We don't value enough our prairie rivers of the Northeast where you have these riparian areas, they're called the woods, you know, right along our riversides. And it's, they just separate our native prairies. Of course, there's not a lot of native prairie in the Red River Valley. They've all been turned into farmland. But they separate that from the river. And um, there's a beautiful one at Turtle River State Park, the Turtle River Forest Loop, Icelandic State Park, um, the Shady Springs Trail. It reminded me of a fairy glen. It's just a mm -hmm. place where you expect to see uh, fairies coming out and taking a look at you because of all the ferns and the um, undergrowth in that area. It's just beautiful. Well, you know, you, you talked a little bit about bring a flashlight. You know, what about some of the tips for planning ahead? I mean, you know, how, how long do these hikes normally take? Uh, well, that depends on the person, okay. you know. But, some, a person can take a half-mile hike, and if they're really interested in, in that area, they could spend an hour on that hike. Mm -hmm. It would take another person 10 minutes, you know, to take that hike. So I don't, some guidebooks that I've read for hiking say the length of time to spend on, it'll take you to take this hike. I don't put that in because I think that varies so by the person and their interests on that trail. But it is good to always tell someone ahead of time, and mm -hmm. I put this in my book, it's important to tell others where you're going and when you expect to return. Some of our hikes in North Dakota are what you'd call off the beaten track. Even I have them in the wildlife refuges, of course, our state parks. Some of our state parks are remote. Um, so it's always good to tell someone where you're going and when you plan to return on your hike. Um, and, of course, dressing for the weather, bringing along sufficient water, especially in the Badlands, mm -hmm. that is no fun to be caught short. I've had this happen, you know. Um, wear sturdy shoes. I was very fortunate. Uh, when I've been hiking in North Dakota, I pick days where I haven't run into a lot of bugs. I don't know how I've been able to do that, but some pe I know that the bugs can be a real problem, so always bring your insect repellent, your sunscreen, things like this. Um, hiking sticks can be helpful, especially in the Badlands. Um, plan to clean up after your dog. That's so important. If you're planning to take your dog on these trails, adequate water for your dog is so important. My dog wears a backpack. Um, that shows here on his picture here. Uh -huh. He carries his own water because water is heavy. 
And also, um, of course, he drinks from streams and any place else he can stick his nose in. But in the Badlands, those don't come along very often, and that's important. But cleaning up after your dog is very important. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, let's uh, talk about, uh, do you, you, you mentioned uh, a good time to read this would be in January. So are, are, is most of the hiking done in the spring, summer, fall? Well, in the <laughs> book, I say our hiking season in North Dakota is generally, you know, mid-April through mid-November. This year, people could get out on the trails at any time. I'm a cross-country skier, too. I'm missing not being able to cross-country ski this year. Some of the trails that I mentioned are open in the winter time, but it's always best to call ahead in the winter to make sure that the trail that you want to take is open. Certain trails, if they're closed in the you know, winter for, for a variety of reasons, I mentioned that in my book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned food. I mean, so I you, do. you have a picnic when you go. I <laughs> do because, you know, and that's for good reason. As I said, some of these hikes are off the beaten track, or even in a state park if they're, you know, there's not always a lot of restaurants right, uh, right nearby. So it makes a, a hike so much more fun if you can take a picnic along. And I'll, I like good food, and I'm not a gourmet cook, but I do like good food, and so I tried to pick out, I just told people what I took on the hike that day that I ate on that um, when I was hiking. So it's, it can be something from as easy as picking up um, a sandwich at a deli and bringing it along with you, you know, to making your own, picking up fried chicken. You know, you can make your own fried chicken or you can pick it up someplace else. Or, you know, cookies and, and things that you can either purchase or make yourself. Mm -hmm. But just to bring along a good picnic, it just adds to the whole experience of sitting outdoors. In fact, I was up at a wildlife refuge in the northwest part of the state, and I would never have seen a moose if I hadn't been sitting there for 30 minutes with my nephew, eating our lunch and just taking a break. And we looked up from our sandwiches and we said, what is that? At first our thought was it's a horse trotting across there, but then, nope, nope, here it was a moose trotting right across the hill, went down to a wetland area, and if we hadn't seen him trotting across that hill and going down to that wetland area, we would have missed him entirely because once he got down to that wetland, his tall legs and his brown body just, you know, disappeared into that uh, the little bit of woods that were along that wetland, and we would never have seen him, hmm. not at all. Speaking of that, you mentioned uh, your interest in sort of the native prairie and the grasslands. Oh, and yes, I am. You know, our native prairie is such a precious resource that we have here in the state of North Dakota. I compare it to the sequoias that they have out in California that you know we think we go out to see and are so special. Well, I can tell you mixed native prairie that we have here in North Dakota is a very special resource too and fast disappearing. And so I picked many hikes in the state where people have an opportunity to get out and experience our native prairie that mm. we have here in the state and to see the beautiful grasses and the wildflowers that grow in it and to have that wonderful sense of space you know, when you're walking through woods, I love to walk through woods. It's a beautiful environment, but it, my husband says it's like walking through a tunnel. I don't agree with him because there's so much to see in a woodland, mm -hmm. but your view is limited. On, a, on native prairie, your views are not limited. For example, as I said, I'm sitting out there on the native prairie. You can spot a moose, you know, a distance away and be able to enjoy that experience or a sunset or a sunrise. Mm. Susan, I wish we had more time, but if people want more information about the book, or who can they contact, where can they go? Well, they can contact me uh, at my home. That's just fine. I have a blog site mm -hmm. for the book. Um, it's, uh, let me just get that for you here. But in the meantime, it's uh, spectacularhikesblogspot.com. Uh, mm -hmm. But the book is available at uh, Barnes & Noble at some local bookstores. What's the one here in Fargo that people like? Well, there's a, a Zanz, Zanbros. Zan, Zanbros, it's mm -hmm. available there. It's also available in, in um, Medora at a local bookstore, but Barnes & Noble, and also the North Dakota Institute for Regional Studies through NDSU, they have the uh, book available there as well. Thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Nice and to be with you today. Happy trails. Thank you. <laughs> Stay tuned for more. Many of the foods we eat come from seeds. Who are the keepers of the seeds? Are older varieties of seeds important? 
We'll explore those questions and more in a segment entitled Seed Savers from the Prairie Public North Dakota Humanities Council Project Key Ingredients. Farmers have historically been the keepers of the seed and have been the plant breeders. Many of the varieties, for instance, in the Oscar Will catalog were varieties that were accessed from people, you know, native peoples. They were indigenous to this landscape and native people had been cultivating them for hundreds of years. The seeds were harvested in the fall along with all the other, with the corn and the squash and the other vegetables. I used to watch my mother do this. She would select the strongest, firmest, straightest ears and set them aside. And like with the corn, they were specific for specific purposes. There was a, a softer corn that they used and they, they ground. And when they ground that up, when it was ripe, they would um, roast it and then grind it and put it with tallow and berries, choke cherries or June berries, the choke cherries they'd be ground up to and they'd make corn balls. And those were food for when they went out and, and lasted them throughout the winter. I want that one. Can you pick it for me? Wow, thank you. Traditional gardening of the Nuata or Mandan is almost gone now. There are elements of it left and it'll just become an and historical artifact. The ideal situation would be to have all of our families again have gardens. I think many, many, many people do. But a lot of us are raising contemporary seeds. And I really believe that it'd be great to have another garden of, of traditional seeds. And I am encouraging all of our Indian people, if you have uh, seeds, to, to dig them out. You know, uh, see if they're good. You know, don't, don't put them all in the ground, but put half of them in there maybe. You know, some of my earliest seeds are, the earliest seeds I have are listed as 1798 as my earliest batch I got, and I got 14 seeds. I haven't grown them in any place, I'm scared. The selection process that we have done has been nothing more than what farmers and gardeners have done for millennia, and really is the base for all of the good food crops that we have today is all the work that, that was done before us. Basically what I do on this farm is I grow uh, and evaluate fresh vegetables and I also run a small seed business, primarily heirloom seeds and then more recently focusing on um, garden seeds on contract to seed companies and seed catalogs. So if I'm thinking if my farm is to be sustainable where the seeds come from is the number one thing that I'm thinking is a, is a key to lead to sustainability. I'm not saying every farmer needs to raise his own seeds, although at one point in time that was a very common practice right where we're at out here in the prairies. Everybody saved their own seeds. If you look at all the old farmsteads, there's granaries and there's seed cleaners in those. But typically with the consolidation in the seed industry, not only in cereal grains but in vegetables and everything else, there's been less seed saving. And some of that's due to patenting and laws that we have to abide by, too. So I think one good way to look to be sustainable, then, is to be able to have seeds adapted and be able to continue. Because that farm can continue if you can continually harvesting seeds. We developed seed production, organic vegetable seed production. It's been a passion of mine for many years, gardening and saving seeds. And I developed some varieties in our garden, and so we just went with that. As we develop more local and regional food systems and address the issues of food security, we also need to address the issues of seed security. That is, in fact, where our food comes from. There was a time when seeds weren't patented, and it's really only fairly recent that they have been able to patent uh, seeds or, or any life form. And uh, my fears have been realized that, that it has resulted in consolidation in the seed industry and less choice for consumers. Seed is relegated to being bought and sold. 
period. It, it cannot be shared, it cannot be saved, it cannot be freely distributed, and it denies people social, political, and economic access to seed. I think it's very important to preserve uh, the genetics found in older varieties. I think a lot of the old varieties of vegetables set the standard for quality, taste, and nutritive value, storability, all the things that were valued in times past. If as seed growers, seed selectors, seed savers, if we focus on those things, that produces good food for healthy bodies, for healthy spirits, and what more as a human community could we ask of our food? I think that's just a great thing to strive for. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded in part by the North Dakota Humanities Council a non-profit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and by the members of Prairie Public.